climate change is an extremely interesting subject academically. And it can also be very frustrating for others. But everyone seems to be talking about it these days. My 83-year-old grandma calls it pralaya, or the end of the world. And uh, the auto rickshaw drivers that I speak to seem to have an opinion on who is to blame. Even the president of the United States can't stop discussing it, despite whatever his personal opinions about it may be. But what makes it so frustrating is the fact that despite the clear evidence about climate change happening, and I'll come to this in a short while, the progress on taking action is moving on at a snail's pace. From 1979, when the first World Climate Conference took place in Geneva, to 2015, when the global climate change deal was signed, it was, a, it was a journey of 36 years. And the reason it's called as a climate deal, especially the word deal, is what makes it so interesting academically, because there are so many pros and cons to consider from social, financial, ecological, environmental, historical, and also cultural issues here. And you know, all of this would take several days to cover, and I'm certainly not an expert on all these subjects. So I limit myself to six short uh, sections or links on the idea that consumption is key to climate change. The obvious signs of climate change and extreme weather events around us. About a month ago, 11,000 scientists came together to mark the 40th anniversary of that first World Climate Conference I referred to, to declare what they're calling a state of climate emergency. And the reason to use the label of emergency is because of the striking and disturbing trends you see in these graphs of rising CO2 emissions, methane, increasing temperature, extreme weather events, and polar ice caps melting. Except for the melting of the Greenland ice cover, the rest are global averages. And so what it means is that there are places on Earth where the localized impacts of climate change is much, much more severe. Here is an illustration of that. This map marks out the vulnerability to climate change across the globe. And it is based on data on extreme weather events for the past 20 years. The darker the orange and red and maroon that you see shows a higher degree of vulnerability and more losses and damages. India is ranked 14th on this index, but the whole region essentially from Pakistan through India and Bangladesh to Myanmar and Vietnam is amongst the most vulnerable regions on the earth. And bear in mind that these are also amongst the most densely populated areas. So that should give you an idea of the level and impacts of damages that climate change could cause here. Taking a closer look at India, here is some data from the Indian Meteorological Department about rising temperatures across central India. What we spoke about was that global averages of rising temperatures has been about 0.75 degrees above normal, or what they call as pre-industrial era times. But in this part of India, the rise in temperatures has been close to 1.5 degrees over the past 100 years. And as you can see, it's rising sharply in recent years. Speaking of extreme rainfall events, which are categorized as events with more than 150 millimeters of rain per day, these have also shown a rapid increase over the last 50 years and has in fact doubled in frequency. Let's bring the story closer home to our city of Pune and talk about the weather and climate in Pune. But here is a caveat, weather and climate are not the same. The weather changes every day, in fact, every hour. And climate is sort of like average weather, the general trends you would expect. The fact that it starts getting warm in March, scorching heat in April and May, it begins to rain in the middle of June, things like that. These are general trends that you would expect. And when you see departures from these general trends, that is when you begin to suspect that there is a new normal or that the climate is changing. This was Pune this year in the month of April, the hottest recorded temperature since 1967. By the third week of June, coastal parts of Maharashtra were wondering where the monsoon had gone because it was the longest wait in over a decade. And by the last week of July, Maharashtra was staring at the possibility of a second consecutive year of drought because the water storage in all its dams was only up to 25% of capacity as opposed to 50% in the previous year. And just a few weeks after that, the picture changed completely. And how? Over August and September, Pune received 200% of its average annual rainfall. 
and by October, it was the, recorded as the third highest wettest monsoon ever in history. And this is happening in Pune, you know, can you imagine that? And if some of you come from the areas of Pashan, my sympathies, <laughs> because Pashan during the month of October was uh, in fact the wettest place on earth, received more rainfall than places like Cherapunji in Meghalaya. So now you understand what I mean by a repeated departure from expected trends. Are these freak occurrences limited to just 2019? Or has there been a trend over the past five years or 10 years? This is an article from Down to Earth, an environmental magazine that I contribute to often, which is taking a look at the impacts of changing rainfall patterns over Maharashtra. Maharashtra is definitely a drought prone area and deficient rain occurs once every five years and a severe drought every eight to nine years. This has been the historical condition. But in recent years, what we are seeing is deficient rain is occurring every two to three years and a severe drought once in every five years, affecting agriculture significantly. So if the signs of climate change around us is so obvious, why is it so hard to take action against it? With this question, we open a Pandora's box of historical responsibility, financial and technological capacity to deal with it, of modeling and trying to forecast what future vulnerabilities would look like. And every suggested action seems to have a trade-off between immediate benefits and long-term impacts. And who pays for these actions? The ones responsible for causing the climate change or the ones who are bearing the consequences of it? These are the kind of questions that puts you in such a controversy and deadlocked negotiations that action on climate change becomes so slow to progress. By now, most of you here understand that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is what is responsible for climate change. And here is a graph that shows you the historical amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and who is responsible for it. Just three countries, mind you, or three regions, the US, the European Union, including Britain for now, and China account for more than 50% of the global CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. And the vulnerable countries in South Asia, including India that you saw on the map earlier, account for a barely visible thin sliver. Even if you looked at current emissions and the so-called fast-growing South Asian economies, including India, they fall well below the, glo the global average per capita emissions. Of course, if you consider the population of India, we do end up third in net emissions, but that is kind of obvious, I think, and a moot point because you're not really discussing where geographical boundaries are drawn or where political boundaries are drawn. If emissions are a consequence of consumption, of lifestyle emissions that benefit individuals and private entities, then surely the costs and the burdens of dealing with it should also be distributed between the same individuals and private entities. Here is a graphic that illustrates the disparity in lifestyle emissions even more. If cold countries feel the need for heating to deal with the harsh winters, it can be argued that the hot tropical countries also need cooling to deal with the summers. And more than 40% of the global population lives in these tropical regions, and less than 8% have access to air conditioning. Compare this with around 90% in the US and Japan, which is why electricity consumption in the US is over 30 times that of India. And take a look at the graph on the right, which shows you the amount of food wastage across these regions. I mean, there should be no reason for this to be happening at this scale, which is why I say that emissions are a result of consumption, our lifestyle, and the state of economy. This is a, a humorous cartoon a friend of mine who works at Down to Earth uses to illustrate the point of where climate change action stands right now. It seems to be about privatizing the benefits and socializing the burden. But this is the biggest stumbling block in taking action on climate change today. The fact that people are not willing to put lifestyle on the negotiation table is what is preventing faster action from taking place. So what happens if these questions about who is responsible for climate change, who takes action, who pays for it, and whom is technology transferred to, if these questions are not resolved quickly, what is going to be the future like? There are various scenarios and models to predict this. And while they may differ on some aspects, there are some elements that they all agree upon. 
which is the fact that by the 20, if you don't take urgent climate change action, by the 2020s, you would see widespread droughts, storm surges, and heat waves. By the 30s, you would see and the devastation of coral reefs and the Arctic possibly becoming ice-free. And by the 2040s, you might see armed conflicts and resource wars because of the amount of water and food insecurity. Some of you in the audience might feel this is a bit of fear-mongering from a typical climate activist. But there are perhaps signs that many of these predictions are already coming true. There are subtle but definite shifts in the climate patterns which have long-term consequences. For example, the late arrival of monsoons is reducing the growing period for crops, which has reduced the yield of them already. The long dry spells between showers has meant that farmers in Maharashtra have to move away from profitable crops like black and green gram, for instance, and to move to lower income crops like jowar or sorghum. And the impacts of the lower yield and extreme weather events has meant that it's affecting the Indian economy significantly, up to 1.5% of its GDP. Remember the 2018 water crisis in Cape Town? During this period, each person in Cape Town was allowed just 50 liters of water per day. Compare this with what we consume on an average in Pune, which is a luxurious 200 liters per day. And there are various models that talk about the risks of such an event happening again. They may differ a little, but on an average, they say that the risk has already increased to thrice. And it doesn't matter what you're, whether you're rich or your higher per capita income, it is not going to insure you against such extreme weather events. And how about armed conflicts and resource wars? These might not be too far off either. The Indus is a river that flows between India and Pakistan, as you know, and a mixture of mismanagement of irrigation and use of water-intensive crops and climate change has meant that the river has reduced to a trickle in parts. And the two countries are, keep threatening to tear up the 1960 Indus Water Treaty. Such flashpoints could easily trigger into a larger armed conflict, as has been seen in the unstable parts of West Asia or Africa. So these business as usual scenarios that I talk about seem quite scary, but like every cloud has a silver lining. These, there are incredible stories of hope, improvements in technology, inspiring people and organizations, and clear actions that you and I can take. The technology story has many aspects to it. For instance, the huge improvements in efficiency in room lighting, for instance, has dropped significantly over the past 50 or 100 years. The viability of using solar and wind has meant that it has become cheaper than gas powered already, and it might soon become even cheaper than coal power. There is incredible work happening at the grassroots to help rural communities adapt to climate change. About 50% of India is dependent on agriculture, and along with allied livelihoods like livestock, fisheries, and forestry, these um, climate-sensitive livelihoods make it extremely sensitive to changes in these weather patterns. Watershed Organization Trust, WOTR, where I work, is doing a lot of interventions to help build resilience to climate change. For example, the pictures on the right show interventions to help mitigate the impacts of droughts and floods through a mixture of watershed development, soil and water conservation. And we are also providing real-time information to farmers through a network of weather stations and locale-specific weather-based agro-advisories that come to the farmers through their mobile phones in local languages so that they can take quick actions about changes in weather conditions. But while we talk about these silver linings, we must remember that some of these clouds are very dark indeed. In 2015, when the world came together to sign that first global climate deal, what they agreed upon was to, to make sure that global warming doesn't exceed two degrees centigrade, or preferably less than 1.5 degrees. And here is a comparison of the different countries and where they stand in terms of their commitments. As you can see, the efforts taken by very few countries is compatible with a 1.5 degree scenario or a two degree scenario. India is one of them, but will it remain there? And for how long? 
especially if you, can, if you consider the fact that we have over 300 million people living below poverty line. And what does that look like? Not having a toilet in the house, having to walk more than 15 minutes just for drinking water, uh, education being just about being able to read, medical facilities being available only for severe health illnesses or pregnancy, four or more people sharing a room as small as five meters square, over the next couple of decades, hundreds of millions of people around the world are going to be lifted out of poverty. And with that, it's going to come an increase in consumption of goods and services and associated emissions. Many of these are the fundamental rights of these people. And so it is but obvious that they should have access to it. But we can do a lot more to grow in a responsible way, provided that responsibility lies with us and not on the poor people we just spoke about. And this brings me to my last section on why the fight depends on you and me. If you analyze emissions, you would realize that more than 75% of it comes from lifestyle-related emissions which are generated within your households. And these could be across sources like nutrition, mobility, housing, consumer goods. The graph on the right shows the wide range of emissions from these same sources between 10 tons per capita to two tons per capita, depending on where you come from, Europe, Asia, or Africa, or South America. The point here is that these sources are all within our control. And whether you take common actions like reducing food wastage, meat consumption, ride sharing, or whether you take more customized solutions like finding appropriate sites for solar and wind technology, or changing your construction and architecture to make homes more uh, insulated and reduce the heating needs. These are all viable options. To illustrate this point, let us just take the first source of food consumption and compare what it looks like between a typical European country, say Finland and India. Now, the average Finn is, of course, a foot taller than us and about 10 to 15 kilos heavier. But that shouldn't be the reason why the carbon footprint of their food consumption is about three and a half times that of ours, unless there is a lot of processed foods, meat consumption, food wastage, uh, et cetera, involved. And it is in examples such as this that you begin to get a sense of foreboding of where India might be headed to were we to follow a similar development trajectory of big houses, big cars, more air conditioning, fast fashion, et cetera. India has always been a low consumption economy, and our per capita emissions have been amongst the least, especially amongst the large economies. But as we grow and catch up with the developed countries, we will have to make sure that our choices remain prudent and we don't repeat historical follies. Today we have the opportunity to redefine development and make sure that it is decoupled from such high emissions. And to illustrate this is my last and final example of transportation in the same example of Finland. By not changing your lifestyle emissions too much and your lifestyle patterns too much just, and just making a few responsible choices, you can reduce your transportation footprint to a quarter by shifting modal transport to public transport, ride sharing, electrical vehicles, and things like this. And it doesn't even have to be a 100% change. What you see in the red and orange graphs show that even a 15 to 30% adoption can bring about a significant change. So today, the choices of what we do lie with you and me, of the food, housing, clothing, recycling, and reducing uses of products. All these things will lead to lower usage of natural resources and keep climate change within manageable limits. And so I urge you to take that one additional responsible step today, which may well be the step that makes India a leader in sustainable development and an example for the world to follow. Thank you.